Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know about a book that's currently available on Amazon. It's called Unclean Spirits, Horrifying Stories by Berkram Mann. And you guys might know Berkram Mann as, well, from No Sleep, as the author of tonight's story, Mandark. Unclean Spirits is a huge collection of stories and a part of the Never Sleep Again Best Creepy Tales book series. It's available now on Amazon in Kindle, paperback, and hardcover. And now, on to tonight's story. They call him Man Pig because of the ghastly snout like cleft in his chin and the chronic lung disease that left him with a raspy voice, which tumbled out of his mouth as grunts and squeals. You know, like a pig. Naturally, it wasn't exactly a term of endearment. See, Manpig and I were together in school, and so I was a personal witness to the hell that he was put through by other kids. It wasn't strange to see flocks of mean teenagers buzzing around him, stripping away at his dignity like woodpeckers with their nasty barbs. And that was when he wasn't busy getting his already unappealing face rearranged by others, all simply for being who he was. Could you imagine what that's like? To have violence heaped on you for simply existing. To be used as a stepping stone for someone looking to climb the social ladder. Things weren't better at home for him either. A mother who was addicted to meth and an abusive alcoholic father made up his family. And I'm using that term very loosely here. It wasn't a surprise to any of us that knew him that he couldn't make much of his life at all. In fact, it was a damn near miracle that he survived decades of abuse and turned into the kind-hearted man people eventually came to know him as. Years after the rest of us had graduated, gone to college, and were moved on with our lives, Manpig chose to go back to our high school to work as a janitor. He chose to shuffle through and clean the same hallways that had so tormented him. Maybe he was trying to exercise old demons. I don't know. But I do know is that he happened to be there when my son was going through the most difficult period in his life. Believe me, I tried everything I could to bring the torment to an end. I approached the school authorities, his teacher, the school counselor, the principal. But to no avail. They fed me platitudes, assured me it'll stop, but it never did. I spoke to the parents of the four boys who were the worst of them all, pleaded, cajoled, threatened to call the police, but it only ended up making things worse. My son started hiding his cuts and bruises. My efforts to help him had resulted in him pulling away from me. Manpig was a godsend at a time like this. He lended an ear to my son when he needed a confidant the most. Perhaps it was due to the fact that Manpig had been through the same shit he was going through. My son found it easy to open up to him. But to this day, I think those conversations were a major part of my son not taking a disastrous step. They bonded well. My son came to look at Manpig as an uncle-like figure, one who in turn completely broke down when my son's torment was escalated one last time. I was in office when I got the call that day. I remember how the coffee mug dropped from my hands and crashed to the floor, some of its shattered pieces bouncing off the tiles and landing on my shoe. I remember being in a daze as I walked out of the building, got in my car and drove to the beginning of the bike trail in the woods behind the school, now cordoned off by yellow tape. I remember shoving aside uniformed police officers and retching when I finally saw him. How broken and bloodied he looked, how his skull had caved in at a point. I still have nightmares about my son's body lying in the dirt track out in the woods. We all knew who did it. But knowing something isn't the same as proving it in court. And besides, those four were kids, juveniles. Even if they were to get convicted, the justice system would just spit them back out on the streets in a couple of years. No. Justice needed to be served here, and it wasn't coming from the, the varnished furnishings of a courtroom. Things needed a medieval touch. 
Once again, it was Manpig who swooped down like an angel and saved me from doing something irreversible. If it hadn't been for him, I would have rotted in some dank prison cell right now. He showed up at my house two days after my son was killed, crying and blubbering in his usual grunts and squeals. I'm so sorry, he wheezed, his chest getting racked with sobs and hiccups. Couldn't help him, he whistled, a breath out of block nasals. Should have been there. Should have stopped them. I wiped tears off my eyes and let him in. We talked about my son over a bottle of liquor and through the haze of cigarette smoke. Quickly hatching a plan for revenge. No. For justice. We hunted them down one by one under the cover of darkness. Through the shadows we moved like death incarnate, stalking our prey. Once again, I could not have done this alone. Creating alibis, picking the right tools, cutting through chain link fences, getting rid of blood soaked clothes. Manpig guided me through it all, even when I was quaking in fear in my car, vomit stuck in my throat. Wondering whether I had it in me to do it or not. He was there right beside me, patting my back, whispering that I could do it. For my boy. Lost to the abyss far before his time. By the fourth one, I was pretty used to it all. The sound of the golf club hitting the back of the kids' heads. And how my muscles stretched with each swing. The mist of blood and brain matter swirled in the air. The eyes rolling back up into the skull. The way their knees buckled as they collapsed onto the ground. I felt nothing. Fear. Sadness, elation, nothing. Just glad that it was done. Over. Little did I know that a lifetime of nightmares was just about to start. He walked into the precinct and just confessed, the reporter's voice blared through the TV. The infamous local serial killer responsible for the murder of many kids I felt a lump in my throat. Man Pig's grainy face was plastered on the screen. A hideous, monstrous thing. Breath escaping my lungs. <laughs> He'd done it. He'd taken the fall, one last gift for the father of the boy he cared for. He knew the cops won't stop hunting. He knew that we're, we weren't perfect criminals and that sooner or later we'd be caught. So he took it upon himself to put a stop to that bleak future by sacrificing himself. Pictures of the victims started flashing on the TV. Five of them. Including my son. My head swooned and I almost blacked out. I grabbed my car keys off the counter and I ran out the door, each stride sending a knife through my heart, slipping into the driver's seat. Fumbling with the keys with sweat soaking my clothes, I tried, I tried to make sense of what I'd just seen. But surely there was a mistake. Surely they'd gotten it wrong or they were trying to, to pin my son's murder on him as well to tie up loose ends with, with a pretty little bow. They let me meet him. A cramped, cold dimly lit cell. He stood up when he saw me. Walking towards the thick bars, wrapped his bony hands around them. A noise erupted from his throat, a grotesque mixture of grunts and squeals, exactly like the one he'd made when he first saw me after my son's death. And that's when I understood. What that sound actually meant. That when he met me that day, he wasn't crying. No, no. He was laughing at me.
Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to wish you a very well, we're getting close to October! <laughs> Are you as excited as I am? Also, thank you for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, if you're listening on Spotify. We're getting further and further into the fall, and closer and closer to those Halloween horror months, which means that if you want to find your nice Halloween horror audiobook to listen to this year, check out audible.com and look for Mr. Creepypasta, because I got a whole bunch of books over there. Books like Tales from the Gas Station. Also, I want to give a very big thank you to all of my Patreons over there on Patreon, because you guys have helped me out quite a bit. Like, not I, yeah, not even quite a bit. You guys are like, honestly, you guys pulled me out of an incredibly dark place when I first had to look at moving and all of the demon stuff that YouTube does, and thank you guys very dearly for all the help that you've given me. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Mitz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, also Dotrade, Payne, Nessie, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764 Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skullbunny, Sashi Suzaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Fay Lockett, Miss Sander, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Once again, thank you all so much to everyone who is in this list of names that I mispronounce, and everyone who's in the description, and everyone who supports me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I can't thank you guys enough for listening, for watching, and I wish you all sweet dreams. Good night, everyone.